Hi everybody. Welcome to Anatomy with Dr. Rabbitheart. I'm Teresa Patitucci, a medical educator and anatomist at the Medical College of Wisconsin. In this video, we will discuss the gross anatomy of the breast, axilla, axillary artery, and veins of the upper limb. By the end of this video, you should be able to identify the parts of the breast and their lymphatic drainage, describe the contents of the axilla, describe blood flow through the arm, including branches of the axillary artery, and describe flow of blood through veins of the upper limb back towards the heart. Here's an outline of each of the topics we will discuss, which correspond to the Roman numerals in the upper left-hand corner of each slide. We will begin with the breast. Breasts are located on the anterior chest wall, superficial to the pectoralis major muscle. Although everyone has breasts, they become more developed in response to certain hormones and vary greatly in size between individuals. Pathology of the breast, specifically breast cancer, is a big issue clinically. In fact, one in eight people assigned female at birth will suffer invasive breast cancer in their lifetime. However, note that a person can develop breast cancer regardless of biological sex. The breast is a modified sweat gland on the anterior thoracic wall, composed of a mass of fatty glandular tissue that extends into the axilla or armpit. This is called the axillary tail. Although everyone has breasts, they become more developed in response to certain hormones during puberty or pregnancy, like estrogen, developing glands and ducts capable of milk production during lactation. Superficially, we can see the nipple, which is a collection of openings from lactiferous ducts. In those with underdeveloped breasts, the nipple overlies the fourth intercostal space. The nipple is surrounded by a darkened region of skin referred to as the areola. Breasts contain suspensory ligaments made of connective tissue that connect the skin to the deep fascia overlying the pectoral muscles. During puberty, ovarian estrogens in those assigned female at birth encourage growth of lobes and ducts. Placental estrogen during pregnancy encourages further growth of those lobes and ducts. Lobes are the glandular tissue capable of producing milk. Milk from each lobe is drained through a lactiferous duct, which conducts milk out of the body through the nipple. Lymphatic channels carry lymph from the breast to lymph nodes in the axilla and thorax. Lymph flows first to a subareolar lymphatic plexus, which is a network of lymphatic channels surrounding the nipple and areola. From here, lymph travels to nearby lymph nodes. Most lymph from the breast, about 75%, drains into the axillary lymph nodes, which are located in the armpit region. Lymph first flows into the anterior, pectoral nodes of this group before passing to other axillary nodes or other groups of lymph nodes like the supraclavicular nodes. Some lymph from the breast may also flow medially to the parasternal lymph nodes. Finally, lymph will be drained into the venous system via the lymphatic duct on the right, as shown here, or the thoracic duct on the left. Lymphatic drainage is incredibly important in the spread of breast cancer. Cancer cells that developed within the breast can metastasize or break away from the tumor and can then travel through lymphatic channels to seed in nearby lymph nodes. From these nodes, cancer cells can continue to grow and spread to other nodes or into the venous system. Note that often during surgeries to remove cancerous breast tissue, lymph nodes will also be collected and analyzed to determine if the cancer has spread from its site of origin. Now let's move on from the breast to discuss the axilla, which is the anatomical term for the armpit. The axilla is a passageway conducting neurovasculature to the upper limb. The medial wall of the axilla is formed by the ribs and laterally bounded by the intertubercular groove of the humerus. The posterior boundary is formed by the latissimus dorsi muscle and scapula, while the anterior wall is the pectoralis major and minor muscles. Although this may not seem like a very exciting place of the body initially, this fat-filled passageway is important for conducting neurovasculature between the thorax and upper limb, including the axillary artery and axillary vein and the brachial plexus, which supply the upper limb. Now let's turn our attention to blood supply to the upper limb, which begins with the subclavian artery. 
the subclavian artery carries oxygenated blood from the heart to the upper limb. As implied by the name, this vessel passes deep to the clavicle to enter the axilla. Once the subclavian artery passes the lateral border of the first rib, it changes names to the axillary artery. Then once the axillary artery passes the inferior border of the teres major muscle, it is again renamed to the brachial artery. The axillary artery starts at the lateral margin of the first rib and continues to the inferior margin of the teres major muscle. We can divide the axillary artery into three parts, where the second part is the component laying deep to the pectoralis minor muscle. Each of these parts give off several branches. The axillary artery has six branches. Off the first part is the superior thoracic artery. This is a small artery on the anterior thoracic wall and may be difficult to find in a lab setting. The second part of the axillary artery has two branches, the thoracoacromial trunk, which emerges from under the pectoralis minor muscle and immediately gives branches towards the pectoral muscles, acromion, and clavicle, and deltoid, and the lateral thoracic artery, which runs superficially along the serratus anterior muscle and partially supplies the breast. The third part of the axillary artery has three branches. First is the subscapular artery, which tends to be pretty large. Then there are the anterior and posterior circumflex humeral arteries, which wrap around the surgical neck of the humerus. The subscapular artery also gives off two branches, the circumflex scapular artery, which wraps around the lateral aspect of the scapula, and the thoracodorsal artery, which runs inferiorly to the latissimus dorsi muscle. Once the axillary artery reaches the inferior border of teres major, it is renamed to the brachial artery. Note that brachial refers to the humerus, so any structure with the root brachial or brachii has an association with this bone. Shortly after the brachial artery begins, it gives off the profunda brachii artery, or deep brachial artery, which passes posterior to the humerus into the posterior compartment of the arm. The brachial artery then travels inferiorly until it bifurcates near the cubital fossa, or the inner elbow, into the radial and ulnar arteries. Although your focus from this video should be on the axillary and brachial arteries, for the sake of completeness, we'll briefly discuss where blood goes after the brachial artery. Near the cubital fossa, the brachial artery bifurcates into the radial artery, which travels along the radius, and the ulnar artery which travels along the ulna. The ulnar artery gives off the common interosseous artery, which immediately divides into the anterior and posterior interosseous arteries. The ulnar and radial arteries enter the hand and then anastomose at the superficial and deep palmar arches. From these arches, common and proper digital arteries provide blood to the fingers. Okay, so let's put that all together. Blood enters the arm via the subclavian artery, which becomes the axillary artery at the lateral border of the first rib. This then becomes the brachial artery at the inferior border of teres major. Near the elbow, the brachial artery splits into the radial and ulnar arteries, which travel to the wrist where they contribute to the superficial and deep palmar arches. Pulses can be felt a few places. So from the brachial artery, either in the medial bicipital groove or the cubital fossa, and the radial artery either at the wrist near the base of the thumb or in the anatomical snuff box. The axillary artery has six branches, superior thoracic, thoracoacromial, lateral thoracic, subscapular, anterior circumflex, and posterior circumflex humeral arteries. Subscapular additionally gives off the circumflex scapular and thoracodorsal arteries. In the arm, the brachial artery gives off the profunda brachii artery, which runs along the posterior humerus. In the forearm, the ulnar artery gives rise to the common interosseous artery, which splits into anterior and posterior interosseous arteries. Of course, blood also needs to be returned from tissues of the upper limb back to the heart. Superficial drain veins drain blood from the skin and other superficial structures. These include the cephalic vein, basilic vein, and median cubital vein. Deep veins drain blood from deeper structures and closely mirror the arteries. Brachial veins run with the brachial artery. 
Then the brachial veins merge with the basilic vein to form the axillary vein. The axillary vein then becomes the subclavian vein. Note that the cephalic vein drains into the subclavian vein. Before we wrap up, let's pause to check your understanding. A patient with a fracture near the mid-shaft of the humerus would be most at risk of bleeding from which artery? Feel free to pause the video to think. The correct answer is C, profunda brachii artery, which branches off the brachial artery and travels closely along the shaft of the humerus posteriorly to supply the posterior compartment of the arm. Last question. In a clinic, a phlebotomist may try to draw blood from a vein passing superficially in the cubital fossa. If they do, which vein are they aiming for? The correct answer is the median cubital vein, which lays just deep to the skin in the inner elbow. I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you like my artwork, subscribe to my channel or follow me on Twitter or Instagram at, at DrRabbitHeart.